We're going to bow in a word of prayer before we come to the word this morning. Let's just bow before Jesus and, and ask his blessing upon the word. Jesus, we just come to you and we thank you that you are true. You speak truth, Lord, whenever you speak. And, and this, this morning, God, we're continuing in the book of John and we're continuing to look at your life and your ministry. And, and God, I know that you have a special um, word for different people that are here today, Lord. You, you speak truth, Lord, and, and we just pray that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say. And we just thank you, God, that we can be together and that we can praise your name and worship you, Lord. And thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So for those of you who are new who, or maybe have been away for a little while, I've been working through the book of John so we're going to be continuing on in the book of John, and we come to chapter 7, and today our text is found in John chapter 7, uh, verses 14 to 36, and we're going to be talking about Jesus um, and his teaching at the temple, and this is the first part of, uh, of a two-part uh, mini-sermon series within uh, the book of John. So last week we discussed uh, in the first 13 verses of John 7, um, that Jesus has perfect timing in everything that he does. Um, he did not want to attend, uh, during the setting of this book here, uh, or this chapter here, um, the Feast of Tabernacles was taking place in Jerusalem, and uh, he didn't want to attend the Feast of Tab Tabernacles with his brothers because he understood that the Jewish leadership wanted to kill him. Um, and his brothers didn't believe that he was the Messiah yet at this, at this point in his ministry. Um, so in jest, they essentially dared him to go to Jerusalem during the feast to make himself known uh, before the uh, Jewish leaders. Um, and Jesus understood that going to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem at the beginning of the feast with his family would be a mistake. Um, and he understood, of course, knowing all things, that, uh, that it was in the wrong timing. However, being a devout Jew, um, Jesus desired to participate in the Feast of Tabernacles in secret. So after his brothers had gone up to Jerusalem, uh, he also departed to celebrate this feast in secret. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Feast of Tabernacles is, it's the celebration where the Jews um, built houses or booths um, and they would stay in those booths to remind them of how God led them through the wilderness in Egypt after they were delivered from slavery in Egypt. Uh, they would make booths. It's a feast of booths, the feast of tabernacles. So they would stay in these, in these tabernacles during this feast time, eight-day feast. And, uh, and then they'd bring sacrifices to the temple. So there was thousands and thousands of Jewish people that would come into the city of Jerusalem at this time. But Jesus... He, you know, people were kind of anticipating that he was going to make an announcement, like uh, I'm, he's going to step onto the stage, and they were asking questions where he was, and, and, and he didn't go with his brothers. They sort of wanted to push him to, to uh, take the stand, but it wasn't the right time. However, um, near the, uh, after his brothers had left, he still wanted to go, so he went in secret. And um, at the beginning of the feast... Uh, he didn't make himself known. But as the feast progressed, near the end of the feast, um, Jesus decided that it was time for him to take a stand, to stand in the temple. And this is where we come to our text this morning. Uh, starting with verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? Now, you have to appreciate the setting here. Like I said, this was in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. There's thousands of Jewish people. Who here has been to Jerusalem? Has anyone here been to Jerusalem? Okay, I've been there. Anyone else? Oh, there's three, four. Okay, it's different people who have been to Jerusalem. One of the things that you recognize when you go to Jerusalem and as particular, if you look from the Mount of Olives down onto Jerusalem, is just the grand size of the Temple Mount. D didn't that amaze you? Like, I know, I know you see pictures of it, but when you're there and you look at it, you go, wow, that's a, that's a big place. 
So there was, during the Feast of Tabernacles, there was literally thousands of people that were in on the Temple Mount um, celebrating this Feast of Tabernacles. So here's Jesus going into the temple courts, and he begins to teach in the temple courts. They were amazed at what he was saying. Um, and Jesus wasn't start interested in starting a revolution in the way that the people thought he, would, he should do that as the Messiah. They were looking for someone who would come in the steps of, of King David and raise a military uh, coup against the Romans. And, and, but the Lord had a different mission. The Lord had a mission to teach the people and show them what God was like in the flesh. At this time, he began to teach them. And his teachings were not shallow. His teachings were deep. And they, they marveled at Jesus. He knew his Bible. He knew the Old Testament. He didn't just understand it, but he could explain it in a way that it was intended to be understood. While teaching the scriptures, they would come to life. And people were amazed because Jesus had no for formal or rabbinical teaching um, he, or training. You see, normally... Um, a rabbi, like to become a rabbi in Judaism, right? Normally a rabbi would go through an intense period of training. And, and, and unless a rabbi was actually at the top of his class, there was little to no chance of him becoming a teacher. Now boys, I mean, you boys memorize scripture, some of you maybe? Eh? Do you, have you guys memorized scripture from Awana or maybe your parents get you to memorize scripture at home or you, you do it on your own? Girls, same thing, right? Can you imagine by the age of 13, now you look at your Bible if you've got a Bible in your hand. Can you imagine by the age of 13 having memorized the entire first five books of the Old Testament? Can you imagine that? Would that be hard? Like you talk about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And having that memorized word for word. Well, this is what was expected of boys that were, were, were aspiring to be rabbis or teachers. Those who passed the test of being able to recite the first five books of the Bible, they would come under the tutel, tutelage, I guess, or the, under the, the study of the rabbi that was testing them. And they would spend time with that rabbi. They'd learn all that that rabbi could teach them with the traditions of, of, of the Jews and, and, and all the things that they deemed as important. But this was not the process that Jesus went through to become a rabbi. This really perplexed the people. Jesus taught differently. He taught with authority. He taught with a depth of understanding that no one else had seen or, or done. And when the people listened to him, they, they were like, where, where is this guy getting his teaching from? Where is he getting his authority from? You remember even when Jesus was a child, when he was a 12-year-old boy, he was found sitting with the scholars and the teachers in the temple, and they were amazed, even at a young age, of how Jesus understood the scriptures. Hmm. So if they couldn't find fault with his grasp of the scriptures and his teaching, they would have to find fault with the man himself. Because Jesus came in a way that was not expected. They expected the future Messiah to step on the stage in a certain way. And you have to understand, all of the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law were teaching people that when the Messiah comes, he's going to do this, 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 and this. Jesus completely didn't do what they thought he would do. So they decided that since he wasn't doing things the way that they were promoting, that he was actually a threat to their system of understanding, to their system of teaching. Where did Jesus' credentials come from? They were talking amongst themselves. Where did this authority come from? In verse 16, Jesus answered, 
My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Now, when you consider what I just read here, Jesus saying, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Jesus is claiming to come directly from heaven. And what he's basically saying is that when I speak, out of my mouth comes forth the word of God. The Apostle Paul told the church in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, many of you are familiar with the scripture. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, Jesus' authority, he was saying, came directly from the Father. And he was critiqued for claiming to be the Son of God, making himself to be equal with God. That's why they wanted to kill him. Here he restates the fact he's not speaking as a mere human being, coming up with his own teaching. He tells them his teaching comes directly from the Father God because God sent him into the world for a purpose. See, Jesus teaches nothing contrary to the will of God because what he teaches is God breathed. Therefore, it is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. When you see the words of Jesus, you can take this to the bank and say, this is truth. What is truth? My word is truth, says the Lord. We can, you see, Jesus presented himself with authority because he was the authority. Because before the world was created, I am. And they didn't want to accept this because he didn't fall in line with how they thought the Messiah should act. But, you see, Jesus is like, in contrast with what I'm saying, you know, mere men, they have their own agendas and they teach others based on their own thoughts and feelings and theories so that other people might think well of them. But Jesus is not motivated to glorify himself. He's motivated to glorify the Father. He's seeking the glory of the one who sent him into the world. And he emphasized that he is telling them the truth. And as the perfect man and messenger of God, all credit is directed to the Father. And Jesus knows the hearts of these religious leaders listening to him. He knows that they're not true seekers of God. Their hearts are far from the Lord. He repeats the same dialogue that he had spoken to the religious leaders after he healed the crippled man at the pool at Bethsaida. And remember, in the former weeks here, we talked about that. How they were angry with Jesus for healing this poor crippled man on the Sabbath. And Jesus said in chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, just to remind us, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So in his response to his accusers, Jesus tells them that he is the one that seeks the Father's glory, that speaks the truth, and that there is no unrighteousness in him. And do you think that made them happy? <laughs> no. Anything but it made them furious because they're, he was take, stealing their thunder. Really, he was stealing their thunder, and that's, that's what this is all about. Jesus is telling them that he's more than just a man because all the men that were there knew that they were sinners, but here is one who is claiming to be sinless. What a bold claim in the statement to be saying that you are perfect sinless. He's claiming to be God on the flesh, is what he's claiming. And the religious leaders were more interested in pursuing their agendas to elevate their own status quo ahead of God's agenda. 
So Jesus asks them, judge me by my doctrine, is what he says, really. Judge me by my doctrine, not by my rabbi seminary credentials. Sometimes we judge people by their credentials rather than by their heart. And Jesus is saying, look at what I'm saying. Look at my heart. See that I am speaking the truth. See, Jesus wasn't self-taught or human-taught. He was God-taught. And he could see everything that they were thinking. So he confronted them. There was a confrontation. He says, has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? Jesus knew that there was murder in their hearts because he didn't fall in line with endorsing them and buffeting their pride. You see, they wanted a Messiah who was going to go, oh, good Pharisee, good teacher of the law. You guys are just great. Oh, I endorse exactly how you're, you're teaching the people. These are the same guys that critique Jesus for healing a poor crippled man who is suffering on the Sabbath. Why are you trying to kill me? He knew there was murder in their hearts. They were breaking the commandments of the Lord, the Ten Commandments of the Lord in their hearts. Thou shalt not kill, but they wanted to kill him. They wanted him out of their way. And Jesus just calls it what it is. He speaks to them and he confronts them and says, why are you trying to kill me? Well, guess what they say to him in response? You're demon-possessed. Can you imagine with all the miracles that Jesus was doing, the fact that his teaching was totally in line with, with everything. It, it, they, they couldn't criticize his teaching. He taught with authority. He taught with power. He made the Old Testament scriptures come alive. You're demon-possessed, they said. The crowd answered, who is trying to kill you? And Jesus responds to them, referring to the miracle that he performed in Bethsaida, Bethesda. He said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though it actually did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. He presents them with a dilemma here. According to the law of Moses, you know, a baby boy, when, when a baby boy is born into a Jewish home, according to the law of Moses, on the eighth day, they were instructed to have him circumcised, to set him apart. A physical marker of being set apart spiritually for God. Well, I mean... Babies, when they were circumcised on the eighth day, it was the perfect time for blood to coagulate, and even though it caused them pain, they healed very quickly. So, but the fact of the matter is, they would do this on the Sabbath day to keep the law of Moses, and in doing so, they would perform some form of work. So here they are, performing circumcision, causing someone pain on the Sabbath, yet they criticize the Lord for taking a man and raising him and telling him to pick up his mat and, mat and go home. The man was suffering. And Jesus met the man in his suffering and had mercy and compassion on him. You see, Jesus expresses something about the heart of God. God finished creating the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. The commandment not to work on the Sabbath was in line with God's desire for man to rest from his physical work so that he might acknowledge the goodness of his creator in blessing us with the provisions that he's given us. It's good to, to honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man because God cares about us. He wants us to rest. He wants us to spend time in reflection on His goodness and on His provisions. It's to set time aside to worship and to refresh our physical body from the weariness of our prolonged labor. It was made for our benefit. But the Sabbath has nothing to do with legalistically um, 
ignoring the work of God in the area of grace and mercy and love towards others. It was not meant to be legalistically applied. This poor man was crippled from birth. It was a work of mercy. You know, since the fall, God has been working tirelessly in the, the realm of, of love and mercy and showing compassion to people. Sin disturbed God's rest and he continues to work ceaselessly to bring humanity back to fellowship with him. So Jesus confronts the religious leaders who are judging him as evil for doing a work of healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus is just saying, listen guys, don't you see? You're judging wrongly. They were so angry with him for healing a guy on the Sabbath, it blows your mind, doesn't it? Can you imagine some poor guy for 35 years laying in one place and barely able to drag himself around, suffering, and then the master comes and heals him and raises him up, and then to, to be angry because he broke some kind of rule? Like, really? Unreal. Jesus rightly confronts the leader, saying, stop judging by mere appearances. Instead, judge correctly. At this point, some of the people of Jerusalem, in verse 25 we read, began to ask, isn't this, man they are tr this the man that they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. So the crowds listening to Jesus were watching how he handled the religious leaders when they confronted him. They were unable to refute him. And because of the silence, they began to wonder maybe if Jesus was beginning to sway them to think that he was the Messiah. But after considering this, they went, oh no, there was a religious tradition of the day that, that suggested that the Messiah would just appear on the scene and that you wouldn't know where he came from. He would just suddenly appear. Jesus boldly stands in front of his critics and he says and Jesus still teaching in the temple courts cried out yes you know me and you know where I am from I am not here on my own authority but he who sent me is true you do not know him but I know him because I am from him and he sent me so the fact is that they thought they would know who the Messiah was because they were relying more on the traditions of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law than they were the actual scriptures themselves. See, Jesus had just finished telling them that he was sinless, that he had come from the Father. They thought they knew him. They thought he was Jesus of Nazareth. And what good comes out of Nazareth? That's what they were thinking. They thought they knew his brothers. They thought they knew his father Joseph the carpenter. He was a carpenter's son who come from Nazareth. But they didn't realize that he'd actually been born in Bethlehem of Judea. In fulfillment of the prophecy given in the book of Micah 5.2, a famous scripture that we quote at Christmas time. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small amongst the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And here's Jesus, born of Bethlehem, but they didn't realize it. They didn't recognize it. They were hyper-focused on the fact that he seemed to come from Nazareth. But we know the story of how the census took place and how Jesus went and was born in Bethlehem. But here comes Jesus to the temple. And another thing they didn't recognize is there's a prophecy in Malachi 3.1 which speaks about everything that had taken place up to this point. In Malachi 3.1, the Father God stated, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Who's that talking about? That is talking about John the Baptist. Then suddenly, the Lord who you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. The scriptures pre presented the fact that Jesus would 
come to the temple. That the Messiah would come to his temple. Not just the temple, his temple. And here he was, the Messiah, right in front of them, and they didn't recognize him. How, how, how similar this is to people today. The message of salvation is preached to them, but they don't recognize the fact that the Savior is right in front of them. The God of this world has minded, blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the truth. See, that needs to be shattered. This is good for us to think about concerning Jesus, you see. Jesus knew. Folks, make no doubt about this. Okay? Sometimes we wonder, well, Jesus, was he confused at all? Did he have any doubts? Did he have any fears about his purpose? No, he, had, he definitely had concerns before he went to the cross. We, we, we hear his heart cry in his flesh because he knew what was coming. But, but there was no doubt in Jesus. There was no doubt in him. Jesus was fully confident in his identity. He didn't have a doubt about why he was coming into the world or who had sent him. He knew who he was. Well, if he knew who he was, he knew who his father was, he knew what his mission was, how does this security that Jesus had in who he was apply to us? That's the question. You see, many of us wonder who we are and why we're here. From the time we're born, we're learning and we're trying to figure things out. It's normal for us to wonder where we came from and, and what our purpose in living is and how we fit into the grand design of things in the world and where we're going to go and how things are going to work in the future. See, this is a natural propensity for us. Naturally, when people are trying to find themselves, they bind themselves to an, ident an identity that can uniquely define them. We know this. You know, when I went to school, for instance, um, in younger grades, there wasn't much of a social structure. It was just the little snotty-nosed kids all together in a big group, and they kind of looked at each other, and they shared their lunch with each other, and, hey, you know, didn't matter what nationality you were or... At least that was my experience. Maybe kids got programmed earlier in your, in your experience, but when my experience, when my first you know, kindergarten, grade one, kids were just like, ah, da, 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 da. they were clued out. They didn't know they should have these or, th or that they would soon have these identities that they would cling to, I would say. We're just a bunch of kids. It didn't matter if we were black or white or what our social preferences were. But by late elementary school, people started to associate to distinct groups, right? There were the jocks. There were the preps. And the headbangers, that's my generation. That, that's, that's where I came from. That's the jocks, the preps, and the head. They're the three primary groups, right? And within those groups, there were subgroups of an entity. In my community, where I grew up, there were the whites, there were the East Indians, and there were the Native, and Native Americans. Now, people say, form their identity. Oh, I'm a white-collar worker. I'm good with numbers. That's where I identify. Well, I'm a blue-collar worker. I, I work with my hands. I'm good at fixing things. Well, well, I play hockey. Well, I'm a musician. I'm a cowboy. I'm a biker. I'm a Ford man now. I just bought a Ford truck. I had Chevy until then, right? Bought a Ford truck. It's nice, but I'm a, I'm a Ford man. I'm a Chevy man. I drive a Dodge. I drive a Honda, or I drive a Harley. Mm. Right, you understand what I'm saying. My phone is an Apple. Oh, I like Android. The list goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Each group we attach ourselves to has perceived common characteristics. 
Every brand that we fix ourselves to, there, there's this common thread that we kind of like to have as something we wear. But when we become believers, folks, things ought to change. Not just ought to change, things got to change. Uh, you see, as a believer in Jesus, we are his disciples. A disciple is a learner or someone who imitates his leader. We are to be clothed in a new identity. Our realized self-worth and desire to make a name for ourselves is based upon input from our environment, our experiences, our temperament. It's become part of our soul. It's what we are raised with. Tempered without God's influence unless we are changed by God. If we are not changed by God, these influences will temper us and will define who we are in this world and will segregate us from others. It will give us bias and prejudice against others who are not like us. But God forbid, as Christians, God calls us to turn to Him and find ourselves in Him. In Matthew 6, 24 and 25, the Lord laid out a teaching for us Christians to follow. Then Jesus said to His disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. As Christians, God's desire is that we come to, the, to realize the reality of our worth and our identity is no longer to be sought for and found in a unique group that we identify with in this world. Our nationality, our culture, our upbringing, our talents, our abilities are irrelevant. Yes, they influence us, but as a kingdom person, as a person who comes to be born again in the Spirit, God's desire is that stuff melts away and that we treat everybody the same. We treat everybody with the love of God and the respect that they deserve. Why? Because they are made in His image. That's why. We're going to deal with sinners on all kinds of different levels. We can't allow sinners and their sin to marginalize how we treat people. Because they're going to hurt us just like they hurt Jesus. We have to treat them as Jesus would treat them. And that is with love. And it's not endorsing behavior that's, that's wrong. We don't endorse that. But we love people in the midst of that. You know what I mean? And as a believer in Christ, God wants us to look at people as precious. Not as a cowboy, as a Dodge truck man, as a Ford truck man, as a whatever, <laughs> as a jock, as a prep, as a headbanger in school, you know, and now kids, I don't even know what the labels are now. There's so many of them. We look at people as unique, created in the image of God, loved by Him. You know what, people? Racial prejudice has got to go out the window. God isn't interested in our culture so much as He is in the heart. We need to approach people with love in our hearts. Understanding that maybe they have a different take on things and maybe not everything in their culture is what we would prefer. But guess what? God loves them. And if we start focusing in on the culture rather than on the people's hearts being precious, we're going to turn people away and we're not going to fulfill the mission that God desires us to fill and the power that He desires us to fulfill it. See, our value as God's creation is not based on certain characteristics we portray or embrace. It never changes and it never elevates one of us above others. Once we come to know Jesus and the Holy Spirit takes residence in us, like Jesus, our identity is no longer linked to this world and its trends the same way that it used to be. It's inevitable that we're going to have cultural bias. But remember, let's keep this before God and say, Lord, if my cultural bias interferes with your work, I need to lay it down. Whatever that cultural bias may be. Man, I, 
if I move to North Vancouver, God forbid, <laughs> I'm going to have to adjust my culture, aren't I? Before I'm going to be able to, to deal with people in that place. Because if I approach them like the caribou cowboy guy that I am, right, without being sensitive to where they're coming from, I'm going to turn people away. That's why Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might win some. I'm not talking about issues of sin. No, we don't embrace the sin of another culture or the sin of our own culture. But we've got to learn to be like Jesus. To know who we are. To know where we come from. And to know our mission. Folks, we need to understand our mission. Our mission is not to elevate our own interest. Our mission is to glorify the Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will be done, God, according to how I see it should be done. Thy will be done. This is where freedom is. As disciples of Christ, remember, we are learners, followers of the Lord. <laughs> you see, Jesus was confident in who he was, his purpose, and where he was going more than any man on this earth ever was. You, my friends, and I no longer need to find our identity apart from Christ. Awake at night, staring at the ceiling, crying out, what am I? Who am I? Where am I going? Losing sleep over it. The answer to your question will become clear as you turn your gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Galatians 6.14, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. God, have thine own way, O Lord, in me. Take the dross and scoop it off. Make my heart pure, O God, so that I can see you, so that I can understand your plan for me and how I fit into this world and how I am supposed to live for you. For my life is no longer my own. I've been purchased with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. I've been purchased by Jesus. I am his. I am yours, Lord. Take my life. Make my life a, a living sacrifice to you. Take my life. Help me to be effective and productive in the gospel for you, Lord, because you are good. I understand that I don't deserve to be in your presence, but nevertheless, you brought me in by your grace. I have been saved through faith. Thank you, Jesus. Now, how, Lord, can I express my love and gratitude to you in return? This is God's plan. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 2, 15-20, and he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them and he was committed to us and he was, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Did you hear that? He's committed to us the message of re reconciliation. We are therefore and Paul's talking to the church as a whole. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So getting back to our text, you see, this, this, is, this is the spirit that Christ was totally submitted to the will of the Father and his disciples, as his learners, as his followers, he calls us to have that same attitude, attitude of gratitude and attitude of confidence. God I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So getting back to our test, Jesus said what he said. He claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God in the flesh who would come into the world to fulfill the promises of God, the sinless one. He was proclaiming this, shouting it from the, from the temple mount in front of thousands of people. 
This did not make the religious leaders happy. It didn't. And you know what? When you stand up for Jesus and you do the right things, folks, you're not going to make people happy. Sometimes people are going to hate you. Even other people are, that are religious will hate you for the radical approach that you're taking. At this they tried to seize him, it says in verse 30, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when this Messiah comes, will he perform, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? See, they wanted to shut him up. But it was not God's time for him to be crucified yet. He wasn't to be the sacrifice yet. It was about six months away from the cross at this point. That's what we believe in the text. Jesus is proclaiming himself. He's stepping forward and the people, you know, some people were looking past the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, their criticism of him. They're saying, could this be the Messiah? We've never heard words from a man like we hear words from this one. And could all the miracles that he's performing be performed by anyone unless God were with him? He, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he is. And people continue to, to believe. You see, church, I believe this with all my heart. If we posture in this way, we tell the truth of what Christ has done and who he is and how he brings life to the brokenhearted. He brings healing to the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He saves people from sin. We, be, we preach Christ in him crucified and Christ will draw people to himself. We elevate Jesus, my friends, and He will do the work. He, the Holy Spirit will beckon people to come. God desires, yes, for us to participate with Him, but the work is done by the Holy Spirit of God. And you are His ambassadors, as though Christ were speaking through you, making His appeal through you. Indeed, He is. Because to be a believer means to be in Christ, to be the temple of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And when you speak, you represent the very person of God. Not that you are God, but you represent Him as His ambassador as though He was making His appeal through you. So the appeal that needs to come from us when we are posturing in front of others is that be reconciled to Christ. There's no hope in this world outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no peace in this world, true lasting peace outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God has made us to be in fellowship with Him. And until we come into fellowship with Him, nothing is right. We're always going to be looking to find ourselves. Don't look for yourself. Look to Christ. And Christ will show you who you are in the name of Jesus. He will show you who you are. You don't have to go searching all over the world trying to find yourself. Find yourself in Christ. Stand and elevate Christ and everything else will be added to you as well. Oh, folks. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about Jesus, about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards out to arrest him. <sighs> they knew that people following Jesus would set aside their traditions and teachings, and they, were, they wanted to protect that for all they were worth. They didn't want to lose their pride. He wanted to maintain it. Today, we can be confident of who we are in Christ, of who he's called us to be. We can be confident that our Lord has the power to save, deliver, and heal. And we can believe him and take him at his word. See, they didn't know who they had in front of them. <laughs> Jesus said, in conclusion here, he said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to another, where does this man intend to go that we can't find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks or teach the Greeks? What does he mean when he says, you will look for me, but you cannot find me, and where I am, you not come, cannot come? See, the people listening to Jesus failed to understand he was saying that he would be going to heaven that now was the time of the visitation of the Messiah. That they saw him. And the apostles said, didn't our hearts churn within us when we heard him, when we saw him? 
They saw Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead, feed 5,000 men with a few loaves and fishes. They saw him do all these miracles, yet their hearts were so distant from God. They failed to understand that the one who is their Savior was right in front of them. Today, we produce a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news. This is good news to you and to me that though our sins be scarlet in color, though we be so corrupted by sin that we can be reconciled to God and washed clean as the freshly fallen snow, though our sins be as scarlet, we can be as white as snow. This is the message of God, not because we deserve it, but because God is merciful, because God has grace for the sinner and he has forgiveness for those who call upon his name. Folks, maybe you're here this morning and you didn't recognize the fact that the gospel being presented to you is, in fact, God's life. You can be reconciled to God today. Don't put it off any longer. If you've fallen away and you've got your eyes on the world and everything that the world has to offer and you're trying to find yourself based upon the things of this world through some sort of identity you don't need that anymore. You need to find your identity in Jesus. And when you do, He'll show you who you are and He'll call you and He'll take you and He'll use you according to His good purposes. Why? Because He loves you and He desires that His children work with Him in His good work. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It is no longer I that live. Lord Jesus, take my life, Lord. Make it yours. Use my life, however you see fit. Take me wherever you want me to go. Does it mean it's just going to make it easy for us? No. The road is hard, my friends. But you trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of your heart. Lean not on your understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and He will make your path straight. He'll show you the way. Find your identity in Jesus today. And if you've wandered into this identity thing, let go. Come to the cross. Acknowledge him. And he'll set you free. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the gospel of life that sets us free. Thank you, God, that you loved us so much that you gave yourself for us when you didn't have to. Though we were sinners, God, you died for us. You saved us. You set us free. Help us to live for you, Lord. Help us to find our identity in you, Lord. Not what the world says we should find our identity in, but in you, in Christ alone. Lord, we thank you that you've given us this honor and privilege to know you. God, I pray for every person that's here this morning that's been discouraged, that's been, been downtrodden. Father, I pray that you give them the strength to put their eyes upon the hills from whence comes their help. Their help comes from the Lord, the creator of heavens and the earth. Lord, you have given them your spirit. Help them to look to you and to trust you. For you are trustworthy even in the midst of trouble. God, I pray that each person would be filled with an extra measure of grace and peace this week. In Jesus' name. If you're here today, and you want to pray, you want prayer, after the service is closed, I'm just going to go back into the prayer room. And if you want to come pray, I'd be happy to pray with you. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.